and it's a sobering thought that the consequences of what happened then may be continuing to cause death even now. Many inquiries are about events which have happened where there, it is known exactly how many people may have died. Few, if any, this may be the first, are where deaths are continuing to happen. So you understand why I say, in that sense, I cannot be glad that you're here at all. Though what I do welcome is that by sheer numbers, you are drawing attention to the importance of this inquiry. I know, because you've told me, that some of you who've been infected or affected by the illness of someone dear to you have felt that not enough attention has been given in the media to the serious issues to be investigated. The sound of silence, if you like. And so I can also welcome the fact that both the written and the televisual press uh, are here in numbers to give some of that attention. And I hope that as the inquiry progresses, they will do what they do best and report it both fearlessly and fairly. Also, before I turn to the purposes of these days of preliminary hearings, I, I'd like to say a thank you. A thank you, that is, to all of you who spoke to me during the consultation period and who helped to shape the terms of reference. In your different ways, from your different backgrounds, from your different perspectives, and with stories to tell which were all individual, you have already taught me a lot, a lot I had not previously appreciated, and I hope that you will continue to do just that. Whether the inquiry succeeds in answering its terms of reference depends very much on you. I know because a, a woman who lost her son specifically asked a member of the inquiry staff last week to remind me of it, that for some, the very fact of the inquiry will reopen old wounds which makes it all the more difficult to bring themselves to play a part, and yet they nonetheless wish to do so. I recognize that bravery, which makes their contributions all the more valuable. What is the purpose of the preliminary hearings over these next three days? As the word preliminary suggests, the inquiry is not taking evidence. It's not hearing the stories of those who want to tell them during the two and a half days to follow. So what is the purpose? Well, just as I have already learned a lot by listening and thinking about some of the accounts given to me during the consultation period, I'm here to listen. And I want to know in particular two things from the core participants. First, to know what aspect of the terms of reference each wishes to emphasize and concentrate on. And secondly, how they can best help to shape the inquiry's procedures to address the mammoth task which it has set itself. So that's its purpose. I want to listen to what you have to say rather than to express any view which I may have. Indeed, how could I have an answer to any of the terms of reference without first considering all the evidence? And we're still very much in the early stages of gathering it, even though there has been quite a lot received so far. Counsel to the inquiry, Jenny Richards, Queen's Counsel, will have more to say about that in a few minutes' time. She'll tell you a lot of the detail of what has happened, what is being done at the moment, what is yet to be done, and what you can expect to happen. Uh, I'm happy for now to leave that detail to her. What I do want to say something about the way I intend this inquiry to be conducted. I am determined 
that the process of this inquiry should be governed by principle. With an inquiry of this magnitude, the principles that will need to guide it have to be very clear. So let me tell you what they are. The first is that I want to put people at the heart of this inquiry. Now that's not just a slogan, I mean it. It has at least, at least three practical consequences. One, the first three months of oral hearings will be taken up by hearing from some of those who've been infected and some of those close to them, parents, family, friends, colleagues, carers, who have been affected. The infected and affected first. But also last. At the end of the oral hearings, there will be a further opportunity for some we could not hear in the first few months. So, the infected and affected first and last. Two, the hearings will not be in a courtroom. They won't be here, but they will not be in a courtroom. This is an inquiry. It's not a court case. And much as I welcome legal representatives, and I do, it's not a trial, whatever it may lead to later. And it's not run for the benefit of lawyers, but for people who are involved. So the hearing room uh, will be designed so that there won't be ranks of lawyers in the front row obscuring the view of the public who need to hear, the people who've been infected, affected, those concerned, those touched by the inquiry. My aim is to have lawyers to one side, press to the other, and members of the public in front of the witness who would take center stage as a witness should. The judge won't. There isn't a judge. It's not an inquiry. Three, the inquiry recognizes how difficult it is for some to relive matters they would want to put behind them. It may be traumatic, and so we intend to have a counseling service, a support service, available for those who want it, uh, and to do our best in, in how we proceed to be sensitive to the way in which individuals are feeling. Putting people at the heart of this inquiry also leads to the next three principles. The longer the inquiry takes, the more will not live to see its consequences. The longer some may suffer the significant anxieties of waiting for its conclusions. Let me tell you, uh, when we were consulting about the terms of reference, I, I confess that the inquiry made something of a mistake. It asked what the time period was that the inquiry should cover. What it meant was well, should it be the time period between 1974 to 1990, 1981 to 1984, 1981 thereafter, whatever uh, the years might have been. But the question as put was a bit clumsy and unclear. And a large number of respondents understood it to be meaning how long should the inquiry itself last? Uh, there was a strong view for reasons which are sadly obvious uh, that it should be quick. Now, putting people at the heart of the inquiry, whether those people seek to attribute blame or seek to evade it, or simply want answers, means listening to what's being said. The question may have been badly drafted, but the answer coming back was clear about the time the inquiry should last. It was there to be heard, and it was. It's led to the principle that the inquiry should be uh, as fast as reasonable thoroughness will permit. Putting people at the heart of the inquiry must recognize that people have different perspectives to bring to the inquiry. You saw some of them this morning reflected in what 
that those who were recorded were saying to you. The perspectives go wider than that. It cannot just be a favored few or even a favored many who are at its heart. Those who wish to attribute blame, those seeking to escape blame, those who wish neither but just seek to understand what happened and why it happened, or to explain their actions, why they did what they did. Those who are hemophiliacs, those who were transfused with infected blood, or those who were both. Those who were patients or those who were doctors. All are people, all are entitled to be heard. And I'd ask all participants to respect that entitlement. However unpalatable they may find some of the ideas or explanations or accusations or assertions being put forward. The principle is to give proper respect to a person's entitlement to be heard. Putting people at the heart of the inquiry means, too, that it will hear infected and affected individuals across the country. The inquiry will not confine itself to London. It is UK-wide, it will be UK-wide, and it will conduct some of its hearings in Edinburgh, in Belfast, in Cardiff, and in the north of England, probably in Leeds. That should enable more people to come in and hear its proceedings firsthand, if they should wish, though they will, of course, be live streaming too. Those, then, are the principles by which this inquiry will operate. But let me deal also with this, that I am determined, so far as it is open to me, to ensure that the work which has to be done by representatives to enable those infected and affected to play a meaningful part in the inquiry will be properly funded. For the heart of the inquiry properly to beat, no less is required. I want this inquiry to be as open and transparent as it is legally possible to be. There's an allegation of cover-up to be investigated, so how could the inquiry itself hide something from you and keep any integrity. You will see the evidence. You will read or hear the evidence which our experts are giving to me. And just look at the range of experts, or the range and number of experts who are willing to give their time to help so far. They're true leaders in their fields and there are more yet to be appointed. The documents which the inquiry sees as relevant, will all be available to core participants. Now, I mentioned the allegation of cover-up. You should know that it is not only the law, but a central principle of mine, that this inquiry is independent of government. It, I, am willing to seek documents which may not have been seen before. We have already requested a number of documents which we would not have got had this not been a statutory inquiry. It is willing to hold people to account where appropriate and it will express its views at the end without fear or favor, affection or ill will. The principles. The inquiry will put people at its heart UK-wide. It will be as fast as reasonable thoroughness will permit. It will pay proper respect to persons' entitlements to be heard. It will be as open and transparent as it is legally possible to be. It will be independent of government and frightened of no one in the conclusions it draws. But there is one final principle which I haven't yet uh, mentioned except in passing. It is that the inquiry will listen to what is being said to it, orally or in writing. And it will think about what is being said. And it brings me back to these preliminary hearings. Uh, I want, for the next two days, to listen to what 
you core participants have to tell me uh, is your particular focus from within the terms of reference and to hear how you think you can best help shape the inquiry's procedures to address the task it has been set. The inquiry involves, after all, a collective effort by all participants, by you, by me, by the inquiry team, by the experts, working together. Listening? Well, thank you for your part, for listening to me now. I've set out the principles, and I shall now pass the baton over to counsel to the inquiry, Jenny Richards, QC, to tell you more of the detail of what has been, what is, uh, and what is yet to be. And I hope you will listen to her as you have listened to me. And thank you again for that. Good afternoon. The purpose of my statement today is to provide information about the workings of the inquiry, in particular to give an update on its work so far, and to map out where the inquiry proposes to go from here. I do not propose at this stage to talk about the events which bring us here, nor could I hope to match the eloquence and power of those whose voices were heard this morning. I want to start by saying a little about the inquiry's terms of reference. The terms of reference for a public inquiry describe the matters which the inquiry is permitted to investigate. An inquiry cannot begin considering evidence until its terms of reference are established. That is not a choice for the inquiry, that is the effect of the inquiry's act. This inquiry's terms of reference were approved by the Minister as the Act requires them to be, but they were approved in the form recommended by the Chair with no alterations. And they were published on the 2nd of July of this year. They were, as many of you know and as the Chair has referred to, the product of a public consultation to which many individuals and others contributed. I think I speak for the whole inquiry team when I say that all those involved in the consultation process found it moving, humbling, and enlightening to listen to what was said. And those contributions informed and shaped those terms of reference. Now, the terms of reference have been widely publicized, and they appear on the inquiry's website. And I know that many here have read and reread them. I don't propose to read them out, but for the benefit of those listening, uh, those watching elsewhere who are not familiar with the terms of reference, I'm just going to set out briefly the six key themes or areas that they cover. Firstly, the terms of reference require us to look at what happened and why. It will involve an examination of the circumstances in which men, women and children treated by the National Health Services in the four parts of the United Kingdom were given infected blood and infected blood products. It will look at what was known about the risks by the medical and scientific community. It will look at issues such as self-sufficiency in blood and blood products. The second area or theme for the terms of reference will seek to establish the scale of what happened. To ascertain as far as practicable the true numbers of people infected in consequence of the use of infected blood products or infected blood. And to examine whether people may have been exposed to the risk of other viruses. The third theme of the terms of reference are the questions of impact and support. The inquiry will look at the impact in all respects on those infected and affected. 
the mental and emotional impact, the physical and medical impact, social, work-related, financial, the strain for many, as we heard this morning, of living lives in secret for many years. And the inquiry in, in this part of its work will scrutinize the support that has or has not been made available, both in terms of treatment and care and in terms of financial support. The fourth theme of the inquiry's terms of reference is to explore key ethical issues around consent, communication, and information sharing. In that part of the inquiry's work, we will look at matters such as what information was provided to people about the risks, diagnosis, and treatment options, how such information was communicated, whether people were treated or tested without their knowledge or consent, or, or for the purposes of research or otherwise. The fifth area of the inquiry's work will be to look at the response of government, of the national health services and others, the medical profession and the like. And the sixth will be to examine whether there has been, as many allege, a cover-up or a lack of candor and openness. Those are, by way of broad outline, the areas which the inquiry is investigating. The inquiry is empowered by its term of, references to, term of reference to look at individual responsibilities as well as organizational and systemic responsibilities, to look at whether there are lessons that can be learnt for the future and to make recommendations. The terms of reference have been crafted in broad but comprehensive terms to allow the inquiry to pursue the lines of investigation identified by so many of you in responding to the consultation. In due course, we will set out and publish, as is the practice for public statutory inquiries, a more in-depth and detailed list of the specific issues on which the inquiry is focusing within each of the terms of reference. That list will be informed by what we hear over the next two days about the priorities of core participants. And when published, it will remain a living and evolving document. We expect that core participants and others will have plenty of suggestions to make by way of additions to that list of issues, and that the inquiry itself will continue to identify new lines of investigation as it analyzes the evidence which it receives. Before I describe some of the steps which the inquiry has taken since its formal establishment on the 2nd of July of this year, I want to say a few words about scale. The inquiry does not underestimate the scale of the task which it faces. It recognizes that this is an immense undertaking which will require an enormous amount of work. It is immense because of the breadth of the issues which are encompassed within the terms of reference. It is immense because of the periods of time which are under investigation. This inquiry is looking not at events which unfolded over minutes, hours, days, weeks, or even months, but at actions and inaction, conduct, decision-making, policy-making over decades. Indeed, whilst the terms of reference take 1970 onwards as their particular focus, the inquiry is already asking for and looking at material dating back to the inception of the National Health Service in 1948. The scale of the task is immense too because of the volume of material, documentary material, which the inquiry is likely to receive and which will run, no doubt, to hundreds of thousands of documents. And most importantly, the scale of the task is immense because of the sheer numbers of people already known to have been infected and affected, the thousands of lives lost or irrevocably damaged or overshadowed by what has happened. Since the inquiry was formally established on the 2nd of July, one of its earliest tasks has been the determination of applications for core participant status. 
This inquiry has, to the best of our knowledge, the largest number of core participants of any public inquiry. There are currently 1,288 core participants, of which the vast majority are infected and affected individuals, 1,272. Those core participants will have a significant role to play in shaping the work of the inquiry. But we recognize, of course, that there are many infected and affected individuals who are not core participants, and it is very important for us to emphasize that this does not mean that their evidence is of any lesser value to the inquiry. In addition to the individuals, there are currently eight charities or campaigning organizations who are core participants. The Scottish Infected Blood Forum, Haemophilia Scotland, Haemophilia Northern Ireland, Haemophilia Wales, the Haemophilia Society, the UK Thalassemia Society, the Hepatitis C Trust, and Factor 8. We anticipate that there are likely to be further applications by other campaigning organizations or charities. Three government departments are core participants. The Department of Health and Social Care for England, the Department of Health Northern Ireland, and the Health and Social Services Group of the Welsh Government. You will hear brief opening statements on behalf of each of those on Wednesday. You will notice that I have not mentioned the Scottish Government's Department of Health. The Scottish Government's Health and Social Care Directorate is not currently, at least, a core participant. And I should, for the benefit of the many affected and infected individuals from Scotland who are participating in this inquiry, explain why we understand that to be the case. We understand that the Scottish Government's current position is that it will not apply to be a core participant because it considers that the inquiry should not, insofar as Scotland is concerned, revisit issues already considered by the Penrose inquiry. That is not the view of this inquiry, nor does it accurately reflect the terms of reference which were the subject of extensive consultation, including in Scotland. Whilst this inquiry will, of course, avoid unnecessary duplication of work done by the Penrose inquiry, the terms of reference which it must deliver clearly applies as much to Scotland as it does to Northern Ireland, Wales and England. It is a matter of regret to the inquiry that the Scottish Government has taken this position, but we can assure all concerned that this does not affect the inquiry's powers vis-à-vis -vis the Scottish Government at all. The inquiry can, and will, indeed already has, exercise its powers under the inquiry rules to request the Scottish Government to provide the documents and other information which the inquiry requires, whether or not it becomes a core participant. Likewise, the Chair can, and if necessary will, exercise his power under Section 21 of the Inquiries Act to order the production of documents and material irrespective of core participant status. I should in fairness add that in any event we have no reason to believe that the Scottish Government will not voluntarily provide that which we ask of it. The four national blood transfusion services are also core participants. NHS Blood and Transport in England, the Scottish National Blood, national blood Transfusion Service, the Welsh Blood Service, and the Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion Service and uh, the Regional Health and Social Care Board for Northern Ireland, which was the successor body to the board responsible for Northern Ireland's Blood Transfusion Service until 1994. It is, we think, very likely that the numbers of core participants will continue to grow. In particular, we are giving careful consideration as to how best to ensure the participation in the inquiry of other NHS bodies such as the trusts and boards responsible for the many haemophilia centres across the United Kingdom, the conduct and decisions of whose former employees will be a central part of the inquiry's work. The inquiry's investigative work has begun in earnest, but there is very much more to do. There have been two principal focuses for the inquiry's investigative work so far. Firstly, obtaining witness statements from infected and affected people and secondly, 
seeking the disclosure of relevant documents from governmental and public bodies and other relevant sources. I shall deal with each in turn. Gathering witness statements from the individuals who are infected or affected is a priority for the inquiry's work for two reasons. Firstly, the poor and deteriorating health of a number of them means we want to receive as many witness statements early in the inquiry as we can. Secondly, as the chair has explained, the experiences of infected and affected people, the accounts they have to give, lie at the heart of this inquiry. On the 2nd of July, immediately upon being set up, the inquiry invited people who were infected or affected in consequence of infected blood products or blood to complete a short form telling the inquiry whether and if so how they would like to give evidence. We received over 1,300 such forms and since then many further individuals have come forward and we expect currently in the region of about 2,200 odd statements from infected or affected people uh, over the coming months. The inquiry has begun the process of obtaining witness statements. So far in terms of the inquiry's own work is concerned, it's identified around 650 individuals from whom the inquiry team itself will be taking statements. You do not need legal representation in order to provide evidence to the inquiry, and individuals who feel able to can draft their own statements or we, the inquiry, will assist with the preparation of the statement for everyone who wants to help. But for the many individuals who are legally represented, we will be asking their legal representatives to obtain those statements, and we will be funding the costs of so doing. This is a process that will continue over the coming months. The focus of these statements will be the individual personal experiences of those who were infected, and the individual personal experiences of their families and loved ones. We understand that it will not be an easy task, that a number of those who will be giving statements are in poor health, and that they are being asked to tell us about highly personal and distressing matters. I should also make clear that before any witness statement is disclosed, i.e. made available to core participants, or is published on the inquiry's website, Individuals who are infected or affected will be able to ask the inquiry not to disclose or publish their name or not to disclose or publish particular information within their statement. And where a witness who is infected or affected requests anonymity, it is likely that the chair will grant that request in light of the fact that so many of these statements will contain highly sensitive and personal medical information. There is a lot more information about this process published on the inquiry's website in its statements of approach. The inquiry has asked and obtained the agreement of the heads of the health service in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales to waive the fees that might otherwise be charged for accessing and copying patients' medical records. The practical effect of that is that you should be able to obtain your medical records without any payment. There is available on the inquiry's website guidance as to how, how to go about obtaining your medical records or those of a deceased family member and copies of the request forms that individuals can use. We also know that there are significant numbers of individuals who in addition to being able to provide their own personal account have, through years of campaigning and diligent research, built up a substantial amount of wider knowledge and information. The inquiry team is keen to work with those individuals so as to make the best use of the information and knowledge which they have acquired. For those who very understandably do not feel able to provide a detailed statement, there is an additional alternative option of providing an account to a rapporteur, a trained professional who will gather together such accounts anonymously in a report to be presented to the chair. That's the first strand of the inquiry's investigative work so far. The second strand has been to require the provision to the inquiry of documents of potential relevance to the terms of reference. 
I propose to say a few words about the mechanics of that process first. There are certain processes which the inquiry has to follow. If the inquiry wishes a person to produce a document, it must send a written request. It's called a Rule 9 request. If that person doesn't comply, the chair can require the person to produce any documents in their custody or control by making an order under Section 21 of the Inquiries Act. Once documents are provided to the inquiry, they will first be assessed by the inquiry for relevance. Consideration will be given by the inquiry at that stage to whether any material that is irrelevant, such as irrelevant personal information, should be redacted. A process of categorizing and indexing documents also has to be undertaken. And I'm sure you will appreciate that this is a time-consuming process that has to be carried out with care and attention to detail. Documents that are assessed as relevant will then be disclosed to core participants. And we are ready to disclose to core participants the first batch of 4,864 documents, which is over 39,000 pages of material. They will be disclosed to core participants via the inquiry's document management system known as Relativity. The inquiry has so far made a large number of requests for documentation from a range of sources. I don't propose to go through all those requests in detail, but to give you a flavor of some of the main requests. Requests for documentation have been issued to the Department of Health and Social Care in England. We have asked amongst other things, for provision of documentation from the HIV haemophiliac litigation, the group uh, contaminated blood products litigation, and unredacted copies of documents hosted on the National Archives, including those provided to the Archer Inquiry and Lord Owen's papers, documents provided by the Department of Health to the Penrose Inquiry and other material. We have asked the Scottish Government and uh, to provide all documents and information provided to the Penrose Inquiry and all documents and information sent to National Records Scotland potentially relevant to the terms of reference. Similar requests have been made to the Welsh and Northern Irish departments. We have made requests to each of the four blood services and have received a very significant volume of material from NHSBT in England and the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. Requests have gone to all the health trusts and boards across the United Kingdom which are responsible for each of the haemophilia centres and we are starting to receive documentation from them. We've received a schedule of information held by the Haemophilia Society and we await provision of those documents. In terms of the trusts and schemes, we've requested the provision of information and documents from the Chief Executive of the McFarlane Trust and the directors of the other Alliance House organizations and will be arranging for the inspection of material which we know they hold. We have sent requests for disclosure and information to five of the large pharmaceutical companies and to the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency. From the police, we have received documents relating to two criminal investigations in Scotland arising out of the treatment of haemophiliacs with blood products. We have sought information from the Prisons and Probation Service about material relating to blood donations by prisoners in the United Kingdom. The UK HCDO has given the inquiry unrestricted access to all of its material, physical and electronic. There is a huge repository of material there that we have begun to search through. Indeed, there are repositories of vast amounts of documentation in various physical and electronic locations. By way of example of scale, NHSBT holds some 90,000 boxes of materials. Many of those will not be relevant to the work of the inquiry, but you will understand that it will take us a considerable amount of time and work to identify, analyze, and share the material that is relevant. So far, we've received about 100,000 documents. We expect to receive and to have to analyze many more times that number. In a letter to the public earlier this year, the chair said that inquiries go through a number of phases, some of which are highly visible to the public, such as hearing evidence from witnesses or indeed these preliminary hearings, some of which are less so, for example, when working through documentary evidence. The chair observed in that letter that it may seem as if nothing is happening 
but be assured a huge amount of work will be performed if the inquiry is to report within a reasonable time, time spent in preparation is critical. Those observations apply with particular force at the present time. Over the coming months, it may seem to you that little is happening, but we can give our assurance that a huge amount of work will be being undertaken. Finally, on the issue of disclosure of documents, earlier this month, the Chair made a statement on disclosure, which is, I think, important and worth repeating now. In that statement, the Chair reminded all relevant organisations of the commitment made by the government to produce all relevant papers. The Minister for the Cabinet Office, having informed Parliament that the Prime Minister had made it clear that the Department of Health and Social Care, the National Health Services and all branches of government should provide full cooperation. The Chair emphasised in his statement the expectation the inquiry has that it will receive the highest level of cooperation from all organisations in responding to requests for documentation and information. And the Chair also explained his expectation that all those providing documents and information give careful consideration to waiving legal professional privilege rather than relying on legal professional privilege to justify withholding material from the inquiry. The next part of the inquiry's work to date has been to gather together the beginnings of the expert groups. The inquiry recognises the importance of independent expert evidence. It is keen to ensure that all expertise provided to the inquiry is transparent and subject to scrutiny and is in the process of establishing a series of expert groups comprising individuals with recognised experience in the relevant fields of expertise. We are not aware of this being a course that's been taken in other public inquiries. This will, we believe, be a first for this inquiry. The purpose of that expert evidence will be to inform and support the inquiry's work, to ensure that the Chair's factual conclusions are soundly based and that any recommendations which he makes are supported by the weight of the best expert opinion. Five broad areas of expertise have been identified thus far. Firstly, public health and administration. Secondly, medical ethics. Thirdly, psychosocial. Fourthly, statistical. And fifthly, clinical. And that will cover clinical specialisms of hematology, transfusion medicine, hepatology and virology. In terms of process, we will be inviting core participants to identify broad issues for consideration by the expert groups. We will publish the letters of instruction that we send to the experts. We will share the reports that are produced by the experts with core participants, and we will publish them on the inquirer's website so that all can read their contents. We will also afford the opportunity for core participants to pose additional questions to the expert groups. If there are differences of view or emphasis amongst members of the group on issues relevant to the inquiry's terms of reference, or where we judge that it will be beneficial or important for expert views to be explored at the hearings, the experts will be invited to give oral evidence. The inquiry published on its website, its new website on Friday, information about some of the experts who've been approached so far. Before I list those experts, for the benefit of those who have not already seen what's on the website, I should make it clear that the membership of the expert groups has not been finally determined, because we would like to hear from core participants any suggestions they might have. We welcome further suggestions from core participants, or indeed from others, of experts for these groups, or if there are additional areas of expertise which you consider would assist the inquiry. The current members of the groups identified so far, some of whom I know are in attendance today, are as follows. In the field of medical ethics, Richard Ashcroft, Professor of Biomedical Ethics at Queen Mary University. Emma Cave, Professor of Healthcare Law at Durham University. Melanie Kazarian, Lecturer in Law at the University of Southampton. Sir Ian Kennedy, QC, Founder of the Centre for Medical Law and Ethics. 
and Julian Savalescu, Director of Oxford Centre for Practical Ethics. In the field of public health and administration, David Armstrong, Professor of Medicine and Sociology at King's College London, Mary Dixon Woods, Professor of Healthcare Improvement Studies at the University of Cambridge, Anne-Marie Farrell, Professor and Chair of Health Thought and Society at La Trobe Law School in Australia. Charles Vincent, Professor of Psychology at Oxford University, and Kieran Walsh, Professor of Health Policy and Management at Manchester Business School. In the field of psychosocial impact, the experts identified so far are Dame Leslie Fallowfield, Professor of Psycho-Oncology at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, and Dame Teresa Marto, Director of the Behaviour and Health Research Unit at the University of Cambridge. Statistics is the next expert area, and there the members of the group identified so far are Sheila Bird, Honorary Professor, University of Edinburgh, Penny Chan, who was Scientific Coordinator of the Canadian Creva Inquiry, Daniela De Angelis, Deputy Director uh, of the Medical Research Council Biostatics Unit at the University of Cambridge, Crystal Donnelly, Professor of Applied Statistics at Oxford University and Statistical Epidemiology at Imperial College. Stephen Evans, Professor of Pharma Pharmacoepidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Nicholas Jewell, Professor of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Graham Medley, Professor of Infectious Disease Modelling and Director of the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Disease at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Sir David Spiegelhalter, President of the Royal Statistical Society. The clinical groups are at the moment uh, uh, less fully populated. The inquiry has sought recommendations from a number of the Royal Colleges uh, and will share those recommendations in due course with core participants. But the experts who have so far agreed to join the clinical group are Jane Anderson, Chair of the National AIDS Trust and a past chair of the British HIV Association, Claire Gerarda, former chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, and David Goldberg, consultant clinical epidemiologist at Health Protection Scotland. It will, I hope, be apparent from that list of those who have been invited, invited to join the expert groups that they are leaders in their field. They are all willing to facilitate the work of the inquiry and know that what is expected of them is the expression of their own independent views. We look forward to receiving suggestions from core participants of others of additional expertise. And I should emphasize that no one should feel under any pressure to identify experts during the course of this preliminary hearing. They are welcome to provide their suggestions to the inquiry over the coming weeks. I turn next to consider the questions of involvement and engagement more generally. In line with the Chair's commitment to transparency and accessibility, people will be able to follow the inquiry's work in a number of ways. The inquiry website will be a source of information throughout the inquiry. People can watch hearings live, at their convenience, read transcripts of all the hearings, read witness statements and expert reports, check the inquiry's statements of approach which explains its ways of working and check practicalities, important practicalities such as how to claim expenses. The inquiry team knows that not everyone likes websites and so they are also communicating with people by email, phone, letter and in person. Over the summer, the inquiry team held a number of engagement meetings in Belfast, Birmingham, Bristol, Cardiff, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle and London so that people could hear about the terms of reference and the plans for these hearings and talk about the work of the inquiry. The inquiry team will be returning to these cities throughout the inquiry so that people can meet and ask questions of the inquiry team. I turn next to the likely organisation of the hearings that will commence in due course. We know that many people have been anxious to know the timescale for the inquiry's work. There are two particularly important factors that are at the forefront of the inquiry's planning in this regard. Firstly, we know that even in the time since a public inquiry was announced, a number of those infected have died. We know 
And I can assure you that this is something which the inquiry team is acutely conscious of, but more will die before the inquiry ends. We understand, therefore, that it is important for the inquiry to undertake its work as quickly as possible. Secondly, however, we know, because this is what you have told us, that many of you consider this to be the last chance to get the answers which you have sought for so long, and that the inquiry must, therefore, be thorough and vigorous. As the Chair has said, therefore, the inquiry's work will be completed as quickly as reasonable thoroughness permits. We are able to give our intended start date for the inquiry's main public hearings. The inquiry intends to start hearing the evidence from the 30th of April 2019. Once it begins, the inquiry proposes to sit for three weeks out of four and for up to four days per week. The structure of the hearings, and this is our provisional thinking only, will be as follows. We propose, as the Chair has said, to start by hearing evidence from a range of infected and affected people. The inquiry wants to hear at first hand the accounts and experiences of those infected and affected covering different groups across the UK. That evidence will be heard in London, in Edinburgh, in Belfast, in Cardiff, and probably in Leeds. We anticipate that this part of the inquiry's evidence will be heard over the three-month period in May, June, and July next year. The next part of the inquiry's hearings will, in all likelihood, start again from the beginning of October of next year. The inquiry's current thinking is that it will, at this point, start hearing evidence about the key issues set out in the first part of its terms of reference, namely, what happened and why. It's this part of the inquiry hearings that will look at what was known or ought to have been known about the risks of infection by government, pharmaceutical companies, licensing authorities, NHS bodies, the medical profession and others. It's this part of the inquiry's hearings that will examine how it was that people with haemophilia were given infected blood products and people requiring transfusion were given infected blood. This part of the inquiry's hearings will look at the adequacy of the systems in place, the questions of self-sufficiency in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and will also hope in that part of the inquiry to look at the likely numbers infected and the risks of exposure to other diseases. We cannot say at this stage precisely how long that part of the inquiry hearings will last but we anticipate that it is likely to be in the region of something like five months' worth of hearings. The third part of the hearings, again, this is all provisional, is to look at treatment, care and support, including financial support, and the many concerns that have been expressed about the trusts and schemes, uh, the differences in financial assistance, and the justification or absence of justification for those differences. We would then propose to sit to hear issues relating to consent, communication and information sharing, those key ethical issues that are still highly relevant to med modern day uh, medical practice. We would then propose to look at the response of government and other bodies and to examine forensically the issues of cover-up and lack of candor. The penultimate part of the inquiry's evidence hearings would be to consider recommendations for the future and to hear evidence related to that. And then the last part of the inquiry's evidence to be heard would be, as the Chair has said, further accounts from those infected and affected. However, I emphasize that this plan, in particular, the sequencing and organization of issues after the first three months, is very provisional. It is dependent upon two factors in particular. Firstly, the views of core participants and others with an interest in the inquiry as to how the inquiry should structure the hearings. 
You may tell us that you think there are better ways of organising and structuring and listening to the evidence. Secondly, it's dependent upon the volume of material that we receive, both in terms of documents and witness statements, all of which will require to be processed, analysed and, where relevant, disclosed to core participants sufficiently in advance of any hearings to enable adequate time for consideration. It may be that in light of those matters, we will have to make adjustments to this provisional timetable and in particular to the order in which we consider particular aspects of the terms of reference. We are not at present able to give a reliable estimate as to how long this process will take because of the huge amount of material that we are expecting to receive. But our best estimate is that once hearings begin at the end of April next year, uh, they will not take less than a year and a quarter. One question that has been raised by many respondents to the consultation process uh, and indeed was trailed in the media yesterday is whether the inquiry is likely to hear from government ministers at relevant times. The answer to that question we think is yes. We will in the course of the investigative work expect to obtain witness statements from senior politicians including successive Secretaries of State for Health, from senior civil servants and senior doctors involved in policy setting and decision making. We anticipate that a number of such witnesses will be expected to give oral evidence and thus be questioned publicly for the first time about their decisions and actions. We expect such witnesses will attend to give evidence without compulsion but the inquiry has no hesitation in using the powers conferred by the Act, if so required. I'd like to conclude by making two points. Firstly, the inquisitorial, not adversarial nature of the inquiry process. It is the inquiry's job to investigate impartially and fairly and to report on the matters detailed in the terms of reference. The inquiry carries out that task of investigation in all the ways that I've been describing, from obtaining and analysing the vast amounts of documentation, from gathering statements from witnesses, and we anticipate we will uh, end up with thousands of such statements, and from holding public hearings at which key witnesses will be questioned. It is a very different process from litigation and the roles of those who participate, whether legally represented or not, differs from the roles of litigants. From the inquirer's perspective, there are no parties, sides or cases to prove, but a process of independent and forensic investigation and examination. My final point is this. We as an inquiry team are acutely aware that lives have been devastated and destroyed in consequence of the use of infected blood products and inflected blood. This inquiry cannot reverse or undo what has happened, but the inquiry team will do everything it reasonably can to provide the answers to the questions that have been sought for so long and to fulfil the inquiry's terms of reference. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, that brings the formal proceedings to a close today, but you are very welcome to stay for a while uh, and chat to each other. You may want to talk about what you have heard. Uh, you may even want to talk to some of the inquiry team uh, if you wish. You're welcome to do that. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you and to begin to hear what the core participants have to say tomorrow.